I want to speak narrowly on the subject of motivation and uh, draw things related to it from our text. Every person in this room has three things and one question. The three things that you have are time, talent, and treasure. And the one question before each and every one of us is how will we use them? Some things are easily squandered. Some things are perfectly spent. And in our text this morning, uh, we see someone who spends herself and something quite valuable on Jesus. And what she does in her sight is a beautiful thing. We'll consider our text this morning, three brief points, plotting to kill Jesus, perfuming to anoint Jesus, and finally proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. I told you it was a sermon. Plotting to kill Jesus. By the time you come to Mark 14, the path before our Savior has become remarkably clear, at least to him. In Mark 13, Jesus' little apocalypse, as it is sometimes called, Jesus has predicted the destruction of the temple and effectively the end of the old order of things. Mark, as he is known for, writes not simply the shortest gospel, but often uses laser-like precision as he focuses on the unfolding drama of redemption through Jesus. In many ways, the story of the Gospel of Mark has been a story of love, betrayal, and murder. Now, as we are in Mark 14, it is two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In some ways, these would be like Christmas and New Year's to the Jews. They were high watermark holidays. They were a time of gathering, a time of celebrating, even a time of eating. As you know, the Jews would come from the north, the south, the east, and the west to Jerusalem at this time to celebrate these feasts and these events. But it was not simply about food, fun, and feasting. It was a very God-centered season in Israel's life. The events themselves, the meals themselves, were designed to take Israel back to what God had done in saving them in history. It took them back to the exodus out of Egypt. It took them back to the reality that God on their behalf had entered history, not simply to save them, but to dwell among them and to keep his promise that he would be their God and they would be his people. God was a promise-making God, but he was also a promise-keeping God. And these feasts, these meals, this celebration reminded them of the beauty of God's covenant promises. It was something they did not simply look back through they also look forward to. But it was, as has also been said, the best of days and the worst of days. As Israel gathers to celebrate and to feast, the chief priests and scribes are also gathering. But they're not gathering to celebrate. They're gathering to conspire and murder. They seek not ways to honor the Messiah and Lamb of God come into the world, but rather to kill him. The irony, of course, is that these are the religious elite of Israel. They're the best of the best of the best. They are the wealthy. They are the influential. They are the powerful. And they feared the people, ironically enough. Their plan to kill Jesus has been talked about now several times in the Gospel of Mark, but they do not act upon this plan, at least not yet. As they conspire off in the shadows, they determine at this point that they will take Jesus by stealth for fear of the people. It is an irony that those who would kill Jesus are afraid of the people of Israel. They wanted to be sly, we might say. They feared a riot could break out. They feared what the Romans would do if such a riot were to break out. See the great irony and the sad commentary that they loved the earthly country God had given them more than the God who gave it to them. Like many of us, if we were honest, they valued, <coughs> excuse me, they valued their time, their talent, and their treasure more than God himself. And so they literally conspire and plan to do this, not during the feast, they said, lest there be an uproar from among the people. The wolves of Isengard have gathered. If you don't know what that means, you're barely saved. <laughs> but there is hope for you. The wolves of Isengard have gathered 
and they're waiting for their moment to prance upon the Lamb of God. It's at this point, we might say these words, enter the woman. The woman who comes, interestingly, into our text and brings us to our second point, perfuming to anoint Jesus. In many ways, the woman is the central figure of the text in the story. Mark tells, if you will, a story within the story, whereas the chief priests are now swarming around Jesus stealthily, slyly trying to figure out some way that they might take him and put him to an end, this woman comes in, inserting almost parenthetically a story within the story. It is not the chief priests or the scribes or even the disciples who are central. It is this woman, and in this text, more is said about her than anyone else. The scene is in Bethany, two days before the great feast. Mark gives us details so you can get the sense that the temperature of the room is rising. It is getting warm. Jesus now, having predicted the destruction of the temple, the end of the old order, moves away from the Mount of Olives and goes to the house of Simon the leper. The text tells us his name, Simon the leper, probably someone who had been healed of his leprosy by Jesus. Jesus often found, even here as elsewhere, among the outcast, those whom the world rejects, those who are stained and ravaged by sin, or often those Jesus will keep close company with. He doesn't simply spend time with them. Notice the posture. Jesus here at the table, reclining, relaxing, eating with his friends. We all know the value of food. We all know what it means that when you say you love someone, it implies at some point you're going to feed them. We all know the joy of sitting around a table with people whom we love and feel comfortable enough to kind of lay back a little bit. That's exactly what Jesus is here doing. Uh, He is reclining at table. A Jewish meal would often be eaten at a low table in the center of a room surrounded by couches. People often in reclining, relaxed type positions. We did not invent the lazy boy chair. And here is Jesus, the God-man, the Son of God come down from heaven, holy, holy, holy in himself, eating, reclining, and relaxing with his friends. It's a beautiful portrait. Those whom he loved around him and those who loved him in return. It is a beautiful scene, the God-man communing with sinners, the God-man communing with his gathered people, eating and drinking previewing the joy of the kingdom of God, a beautiful scene that is about to become even more beautiful when this unnamed woman enters the room. And what does she do? This unnamed woman enters the room quietly. Not a word is said from her lips in the entire story. This unnamed woman comes in with an alabaster flask of ointment and pure nard. Now, none of us have seen these things. The alabaster flask all by itself was very expensive This is an expensive container holding expensive perfume. It is clearly expensive, as is pointed out later by unnamed individuals in the text, and its value of the pure nard inside is about 300 denarii, which is a year's wage for a middle-class person at this time. Your year wage in a bottle, in a flask, There's no explanation given. Why does this woman come? We're not told. She does not say anything that makes it rather clear uh, on her own. Jesus will explain it, but no one else. No words are recorded, only her actions. It's as though she is on a mission, a rather resolved, simple mission, but she will not be deterred. She is silent, stealth-like as she comes. She is serious and focused on how she will spend her time, her talent, and her treasure. She enters the room, And all we're told is that she breaks this expensive alabaster flask of expensive pure nard over the head of Jesus. She breaks it and pours it over his head. We should pause and ask why. Why has she done this? Why has she laid it? Excuse me. Why has God laid it on her heart? Uh, We might all be wondering this, but we're not the only ones who wonder. There are others in the room, unnamed, but they are not voiceless. They are, to themselves, quietly indignant. But then they ask, why was this not sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor? A seemingly pious question. 
Mark tells us not only what they said out loud, but what they thought internally towards the woman. They were indignant, put it in our language. They were put out. They were ticked off. They were upset. Verse 8 records their interaction with the woman. They scolded her. They verbally abused her. Who likes being scolded? I hate being scolded. I could venture confidently everyone in this room knows the feeling of being scolded. When someone disapproves of what you have done and will not let it go. They don't simply let you know. They let you know over and over and over as though beating you down with a hammer of disapproval. Their words berate you. The very tone of their words seem to come with a poison intended to sicken you. Whether they are right or wrong, they will not be satisfied until they know that you've been broken by the weight of their disapproving. That's what it means to be scolded. And what has she done to deserve such verbal abuse? Had she wasted her time, her talent, and her treasure on Jesus? Had she wasted her time, talent, and treasure on Jesus? And Claire Ferguson notes that if this woman was a middle-class woman, uh, this was likely her retirement savings, literally, in a jar. If she was a wealthy woman, then this was likely something she'd be saving up for a rainy day, like an annual vacation. A poor woman would not have such an alabaster flask. Either way, we might say that what she has in this perfume flask represented her future, her life. And she poured it out. She poured it out freely. She poured it out willingly on Jesus. And this brings us to the gospel, perhaps an extended version thereof, proclaiming the gospel. What does Jesus do in response to this woman's action, perhaps even more so? What does Jesus do in response to those who scold her? Well, he joined them. It's always easy to gang up on the weak one in the room. He does not. In contrast to her unnamed critics, Jesus does not scold her. He actually defends her. He knows the heart. He knows the plan of God. He knows that people are prone to misunderstanding even our good intentions or motives. Jesus sees her heart, but not simply her heart. He sees what God is doing. He sees the heart of God in the action of God's people, the heart of his father being displayed by this new sister, if you will. And he says almost defensively, you can hear it like a big brother protecting his little sister from other siblings. Leave her alone. Leave her alone, he says. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing, literally in the Greek, a good work. What they see is a waste. Jesus sees as beautiful. And there's an excellent point of application here. This is the way the world often views our service to God. Look at you, wasting your time, wasting your talent, wasting your treasure on Jesus and his church. Look what you could have done with these things instead. But Jesus goes on, even beyond rebuking their misplaced piety. He gives them a little bit of a lecture. He says, you, can, you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. The poor will always be there. I live just north of San Diego. <clears throat> There's not a day, literally not a day that goes by that I don't drive past collages of homeless people in between school work in our home. There's a dog park behind our house. It's really pretty to look at. And in the nighttime, it's inhabited by homeless people that come out of the, uh, I'm not even sure where they come out of, and will sometimes nest there overnight. And then they're chased out by the dogs in the morning. The homeless, the poor, Jesus says, you will always have with you, but you will not always have him. Jesus' time was at hand. Soon the curtain on his final act would close. Whether this woman truly understood it or not, his time was coming to an end. But Jesus says something that almost gives the signal that this woman understands what the wolves of Isengard do not. This woman understands what the scribes and Pharisees do not. This woman may even understand what the disciples do not yet understand. And that is, as he puts it in verse 8, she has anointed me for my burial. That's an amazing statement. Because so far, the disciples do not seem to comprehend what this woman does. 
but explains so much of her actions, the perfume that is used, the precise type of perfume that is used was often used for a person's burial. But this is what is profound. You would never use it before a person's burial because you would not expect their coming death. This is used after death. This is what you put on someone who has already died. The brilliance, the remarkable quality of what happens here is that she doesn't come to pour this on Jesus after his death. She comes before his death as though anointing him for his death. This woman somehow seems to know in the providence of God that Jesus must die. She is on a mission that God has written within her heart. What the disciples don't know, she already does. In a certain sense, she has already begun to grieve his, le- his death. She has already begun to prepare not simply him for his death, but even herself. Perhaps she could see the cloud of opposition gathering. Perhaps she heard echoes of the voices of the wolves of Isengard as they sharpen their fangs and conspire their plan. Perhaps like so many times in scripture, what remains hidden to the wise and self-exalting, God has been pleased to reveal to babes, to those who are simple of faith and heart. The wisdom of God is often foolishness in the eyes of the world. And so it is here. The wisdom of God and what she does, foolishness in the eyes of those who sit there, even with Jesus. It's here that we pause and take a step back. Perhaps we need it, something like a small reprieve. Because this woman who comes, who appears to be alone, in a certain sense, is not alone. She has a companion, one that perhaps she has not yet even met. But if you've been with me going through the book of Mark, which none of you have, but we have met, at least in my view, and I say it like that because I want to be careful uh, with observations like this. I think Mark is doing something here that's rather brilliant. Mark has given us in chapter 13, what is sometimes referred to as Mark's little apocalypse. Uh, but if you look at his apocalyptic language regarding the destruction of the temple, it is laser-like, but it's also poetic. And he does something uh, rather remarkable. He bookends his little apocalypse uh, with two things. There is a fig tree reference on both sides of Jesus' little apocalypse. But there are also, be with me here, it's very important, I think, two women. There are two women that explain why judgment is coming. There is a widow whom you meet at the beginning. There is a woman whom you meet at the end. Both of them enter the story unnamed and speechless. It is not what they say, but what they do that matters so much to Mark and ultimately the Spirit. Each of them pours something out. That's very costly. The widow, her might, effectively her life, her whole bios, as Mark puts it here, uh, this woman's future, her retirement, if not uh, something saved up significantly. Each of them pours out their time, their talent, their treasure, summarizing what they hold in hand, one into the temple in a ministry that is about to fade, the other onto Jesus, whose everlasting ministry she will benefit from. The widow gives her all into the temple treasury. This woman gives her all unto the head of Jesus who fulfills that fading ministry. What should we see? The temple, its ministry, its sacrifice, its priesthood are all coming not simply to an end, to a violent end. But as God ends the old order, he establishes the new. A new and better t- temple is here. A new and better sacrifice is about to be offered. A faithful high priest whose ministry will never end is about to begin in Jesus himself. What this woman does is not some random, awkward mission. She's not wasting her time, her talent, or her treasure. She has in many ways been sent by God the Father to anoint Jesus, God the Son, for his death. Jesus will die. The Lamb of God will be slaughtered. Jesus will die. The author of life will be buried. Jesus will die, but Jesus will live again. A better temple, a better sacrifice, a better priesthood, a better ministry. One that ends not in death, but one that ends rather with life. 
This is the gospel and the climax of our text. This woman pours out her life upon Jesus because somehow she knows in the providence and plan of God that Jesus has come to pour out his life for her. It is what we call the great exchange, a life for a life. Not that she gives her life in order to return, to earn eternal life, but she gives her life into the hands of the ones who will earn it for her. It is the gospel of the kingdom. She pours out her earthly life for the one who has come to give her that which she can never lose. Upon Jesus, she places her hope, her dreams, her future. Upon Jesus, she places all her expectation of what God will do. And beloved, this is love and this is life. This is the gospel of the kingdom, that in the gospel, we who willingly give our life away in this world, spending our time, talent, and treasure upon Jesus will never lose it. In fact, we get back far more than we ever give away. Though we lose our life in this world, we find it in Jesus. And what is true life? but not union with him and true communion with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you think reclining at that table was nice, there's a far better table that awaits. Isaiah 61 seems to come into the back of this, Jesus being anointed not simply to die, but to live as priest and proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. Jesus refers as happening not just by himself, but through his church. This woman, Jesus says, will be remembered throughout history. When the gospel is preached... This woman's deeds will be remembered. Jesus knows he will be raised. Jesus knows his spirit will be sent. Jesus knows his gospel will be preached. Jesus knows this woman's kindness and sacrifice will be remembered. Jesus knows that in his story, her story has found meaning, and so does yours and mine. Her sweet-smelling sacrifice billows on through time, wafting up pleasingly into the nostrils of God. Even as her story is echoed down the pages of history, her life now hidden in God, her story found in the gospel, her sacrifice, the emblem of the Christian life. What do we mean by that? A couple closing comments. We all have three things and one question. We all have time. We all have talent. And we all have treasure. And the question is, how will we use them? For our life is found in God, hidden in God, eternal with Jesus. Is there anything we can truly lose? Did she really squander her future? And what can we give away that God will himself not more than generously repay? Whether we are young or old, we should leave here asking the question, what are we doing with our time, our talent, and our treasure? Is there anything you can pour out onto Jesus that would be a waste? And in the gospel of the kingdom, shall we not have far more than this woman or those who sat at his table enjoy? For as the picture so romantically says, and somehow she seemed to know, not simply was his death imminent, but the best was yet to come. Let's pray. Our Lord, we do thank you for your kindness in the gospel, your generosity that flows from your hand. We ask, O Lord, that we would learn the lesson of this woman who squandered not her time, talent, and treasure, but in pouring them all upon Jesus, model for us the way of the kingdom. And so I pray for my brothers and sisters and even myself, Lord, help us not to squander these good, beautiful things that you've given to us, but rather, O Lord, might we pour them, lavish them upon you, and see what good you will do with them. Bless us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.